thank you all for uh, attending the virtual Mershon Center for International Security Studies. I'm Professor Peter Monsoor, uh, one of the uh, co-chairs of the American Foreign Military Policy Cluster. And it is our great pleasure today to have with us Jacob Helberg, um, who is a senior advisor at the Stanford University Center on Geopolitics, Technology, and Governance, and an adjunct fellow at CSIS, the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Uh, Jacob is also the co-chair of the Brookings Institution China Strategy Initiative from 2016 to 2020. He led Google's internal global po product policy efforts to, to combat disinformation and foreign interference, including policy and enforcement processes against state-backed foreign interference, misinformation, and actors undermining election integrity. Jacob studied international affairs at the George Washington University and received his Master of Science in Cyber, Cybersecurity Risk and Strategy from New York University. And today he's going to talk to us about his new book, uh, The Wires of War. So we're very happy, uh, Jacob, to have you with us today. And I will turn the floor over to you for uh, your discussion of your book, anywhere from 45 to 60 minutes. And if uh, those of you in the audience who um, have questions, please use the Q&A feature, which you'll see at the bottom of your screen, and write your question into the Q&A feature, and then I'll moderate the question and answer session when Jacob's done. So Jacob, over to you. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, thank you to Professor Monsoor for having me, and it's such an honor to speak to you guys today. Um, my uh, dad was an alumni, and uh, and I spent you know, many, many summers in Ohio. So it's it's fun to be uh, addressing a crowd that, um, you know, is in a community uh, where I obviously have a lot of fond memories. And uh, I actually wrote about this in my book as well. Uh, my journey with this book started when, uh, as you pointed out, when I worked at Google, I um, worked to help develop the company's overarching policy against fighting foreign interference. And quickly that worked evolved into thinking through, um, as we thought about a holistic strategy, um, how do we deal with the new dynamics at work of how governments are increasingly using technology, dual use technologies and, and uh, technology companies as both targets and proxies of their respective national power. And so I quickly realized that a lot of that work transcended uh, and a lot of the questions at hand transcended a single company and were really impacting, were really about the security of the country and relevant to uh, a whole industry, which is why I ultimately decided to leave Google to write this book because um, the issues that I talk about in the book, in my view, really cut across the tech industry as well as the government and ultimately call for an enormous amount of collaboration between our tech companies and, and the US government. So today, um, I'd like to talk about five big trends and um, observations that I cover in the book without, try with, without trying to reveal too much about the content of the book, uh, because obviously I'd encourage everyone to go get it. But, um, but I'd like to talk about five core observations that uh, stood out to me when I wrote the book as really being um, key takeaways. Um, and, and things that uh, were particularly important to me when I read the book. The first is that um, what I call the gray war is fundamentally redefining international politics. And so today we're dealing, we're seeing the world where, we're seeing a world where the global economy is more interconnected and intertwined than at any point since World War II. And the costs and risks of an overt international war are so damaging that the most powerful nations in the world have up until now de been deterred from engaging in a direct military conflict. But that doesn't mean that geopolitical struggles have stopped. And war and peace fundamentally have never been binary and have always been a spectrum. And so what we're seeing today is that great powers are increasingly subverting and leveraging technologies that make up our everyday lives to advance their interests and weaken their adversaries in the ambiguous gray zone between war and peace. And so that's why I called this new paradigm the gray war, because a lot of this geopolitical competition and conflict 
is taking place between the conventional thresholds of war and peace. They're competing over trade routes and fiber optic internet cables. Gray zone warfare is now so pervasive that and, and such a predominant feature of international politics that um, it's, it's increasingly driving a lot of day-to-day -day events. And um, this is actually a good segue into the second trend, um, uh, which is that uh, fundamentally the new weapons that people, that, that countries use to fight and compete with each other today are less so nuclear weapons, although um, those are still important, but they're uh, dual use technologies. So unlike in the days of the Cold War, today's new tech-fueled gray war is primarily being fought by these new foundational technologies that are mostly developed by private companies for civilian purposes. And the reason has to do with the inverse relationship between the degree of destructiveness of a given technology and its rational usability. So for example, as, as I point out in the book, um, Hans Morgenthau, who worked for President Franklin Roosevelt, pointed out that a nation armed with nothing more than high yield nuclear weapons would have no military means to impose its will on another country other than either total annihilation or complete inaction. And so <clears throat> compare that with commercial civilian dual use technologies like artificial intelligence, 5G or drones that can be leveraged to carry out increasingly high impact attacks uh, against an adversary in a way that's often far harder to attribute than attacks carried out with conventional weapons. Um, that's why the result is that these new technologies um, uh, the result of these new technologies is that an aggressor often has the ability to deny its involvement in an attack and reduce the risk of a costly retaliation. So in other words, it's because they're effective and far less risky for aggressors uh, that commercial dual use technologies have also become highly quote unquote usable forms of weapons today. So governments can use them and deploy them for the daily conduct of strategic affairs in a way that's far more rational without triggering significant costs to themselves uh, or their populations. And that's exactly what they're doing. So in my book, I call that the usability destructiveness paradox of modern warfare, which is the, the inverse relationship between how destructive a weapon is and its practical usability for the day-to-day -day conduct of political warfare. So that's the second observation. The third is um, that the face of modern day censorship has changed. Um, so in the era of news feeds, modern day censorship isn't so much simply about whether or not information is in or out, it's about whether it's up or down. Autocrats distort what internet users see on their infinity feeds across content platforms using two distinct uh, tactics. The first is what I call in the book fire hosing, um, and the second is information laundering. Fire hosing basically entails artificially pumping so much information onto the internet as if it were coming out of a giant fire hose um, around a particular topic that it swamps out everything else published on that same topic. So by doing this, autocrats can basically artificially push down and suppress pieces of information and pieces of content written by other people organically. So one example, the best way to think about it is um, if, if you artificially publish so much content using the same types of keywords on a topic where that hasn't been widely covered, you can basically uh, attempt to distort the information that people see on various types of platforms uh, and effectively sense, you know, it's a different form of censorship when you uh, suppress and uh, one narrative to promote another. So the result is that contents that autocrats don't like become harder to see and access by every internet, by everyday internet users. Um, information laundering, on the other hand, is when an autocrat is when an autocratic government publishes and and artificially amplifies stories and narratives they want to promote to the detriment of other content around the same subject. So that tactic usually aims to exploit online virality 
in order to launder fringe narratives into more mainstream forums. Both methods amount to different ways of artificially distorting the information internet users can see. And the result is the suppression of one type of content and the promotion of another. So <clears throat> different tactics, same result. Um, that marks fundamentally a new and different censorship paradigm than the old paradigm of simply blocking or banning access to information. The fourth, uh, which in my view, and as I talk about in the book, is the more important one, um, is um, that old conceptions of sovereignty no longer apply. So the CIA estimates that the Chinese government has subsidized Huawei uh, to the tune of at least $75 billion. Observers around the world initially assumed that the motives of the Chinese government for these subsidies were primarily commercial and economic, but more recently, we've seen that there are also important political implications. So for instance, a newly disclosed 2010 risk assessment commissioned by KPN, which is a Dutch telecommunications company, um, Huawei can have completely unfettered access to everything that runs on top of its network, including all conversations and telephone numbers of political leaders and intelligence service officers. Um, and so the takeaway is that control of the internet at the hardware level can effectively allow a government to access, block, and manipulate any data that runs on top of it. So in a gray war environment, control is power and infrastructure is control. And that's one of the big um, uh, points that I try to emphasize in the book. That creates a fundamental challenge to traditional conceptions of national sovereignty because political control is no longer determined, merely determined by boots on the ground. It's determined by wires in the ground. So just imagine, as Yuval Harari once asked, what might happen if a foreign adversary government uh, knew the entire medical and personal history of every politician, every judge, every journalist, including all their sexual escapades, all their mental weaknesses, and all their corrupt dealings. Would we be a sovereign, would we be sovereign nations or light states? And so when you control the wires in the ground, you no longer have to send troops on the ground. It it's, um, completely causes um, a change in how we understand national sovereignty to work. Um, the last point about that is that fundamentally, the reason that what China is doing with Huawei and ZT is so concerning is that effectively, they're using 21st century tools to recreate 20th century style spheres of influence. It's the same you know, uh, dynamics than we saw during the 20th century when the Soviet Union was carving up the world into a Soviet bloc, except here, instead of invading countries, they're basically trying to um, assert their political control over countries through technology, through information infrastructure. The last point is that deindustrialization is disarmament uh, in our day and age. In 2011, President Obama attended an intimate dinner in Silicon Valley. And at one point he turned to Steve Jobs and asked, what would it take for Apple to manufacture its iPhones in the United States instead of China? And Steve Jobs responded, you know, those jobs aren't coming back. And that response captured a cross-cutting assumption um, the American policymaking community accepted as true for at least a generation. But I think now we've reached a point where a lot of people in Washington and the tech industry and in our culture, you know, in, in modern day uh, thought leadership culture, a lot of people in the press um, have been asking, you know, what if we were wrong? Why is it that we can't make things in this country? Why is it that we can't try to make things that have, that are strategic to the, the economic security of the country? We saw that in the early days of the coronavirus pandemic when we were running out of almost everything. We see that today with our supply chain problems. Um, and so, you know, the follow-up question is, can the US afford not to bring some of those jobs back? Um, or at the very least, can we afford to leave those jobs in China, you know, as opposed to elsewhere? So as, as we've seen since the start of the pandemic, the recent weaponization of supply chains and information networks 
exposes enormous dangers um, uh, with respect to the deindustrialization that we've often accepted as inevitable. And so in the, this new gray war, a deindustrialized United States is a disarmed United States, meaning a country that's precariously vulnerable to coercion, espionage, foreign interference. If the US is going to secure its supply chains and information networks against the very real threats of Chinese attacks, it's going to have to find ways of reindustrializing, at least in verticals in industries that are absolutely critical to the national security of the country, as well as to our, you know, the basic building blocks of our economic security. Um, and so in my view today, the question isn't so much about whether American America's manufacturing jobs can return, but whether we can afford not to bring some of those back. Um, the last point on deindustrialization, the two big um, aspects that are the most problematic with respect to uh, manufacturing and supply chain security are that uh, our integrity and access. And so, and we saw that in shine in full technicolor during the pandemic. And integrity means um, if you, if we have all of our supply chains based in China, even if they don't cut off our access to those supply chains, if they continue providing us, you know, all the goods that our companies manufacture there, um, there are some serious integrity problems because they might be embedding back doors into all of the systems that they're building without us knowing. Um, and obviously there was, you know, the canonical example of, of uh, for this was um, a few years ago, there was a big Bloomberg article expose that basically leveled allegations that there were um, um, that uh, circuit boards, the, the, Amazon was considering buying a company, I think it was called Supermicro, and Supermicro was in the was building um, circuit boards in China that were potentially potentially had tiny, tiny little microchips onto the circuit board that were basically back doors um, uh, inserted by the CCP. And ultimately, you know, Apple and, and Amazon and everyone denied that they had any issues with their circuit boards. But the reality is that no one really knows. Uh, and, and the reason why Amazon might have found an issue is because they have the resources to do due diligence on the machines that it buys, to open them up, look at the circuit boards. Most companies don't have the kind of bandwidth and, um, and, and resources to do that. So if, if, our, if all of our electronics are made in China, there is a real integrity risk about whether or not there may be back doors into a lot of these devices. So that's um, the, the long explanation of uh, what the integrity risk is. The access risk is the more straightforward issue, which is that uh, from one day to the next, they could either overtly you know, create delays or um, or basically prevent us from accessing supply chains altogether, or covertly create artificial delays without making it clear that you know the delays are intentional and deliberate. Um, and so, and so ultimately, you know, the access problem is, is a real issue. Uh, that you know, as a country, if we want to be able to have and maintain the way of life that we grew up with, meaning. You go to the store, you can rely on getting goods, you know, on shelves at a store, you know, you uh, have, you know, a fairly normal way of doing things. Um, I think it's, it's a healthy thing for us to think through these questions. And ultimately, Congress and the policymaking community is going to have to think through divvying up, you know, what are the basket of things that are so critical to national security that they have to be made here in the U.S.? Um, what are the, the basket of issues that can be made in some sort of allied space that are important, you know, important to the country, but they don't have to, they, we don't want them to be made in China, but, um, but they don't have to necessarily be made in the US. We can trust other allied countries, you know, to be sources of suppliers for them. And what are the, the basket of goods where we don't really care where it comes from because um, it's not that, it doesn't really matter that much for national security purposes. Um, and I think thinking through how the universe of those products uh, are organized is something that a lot of people in the policymaking community is probably going to have to um, 
spend quite a bit of time thinking about over the next few years. Um, so with that, uh, those are the five big observations that uh, I wanted to highlight in the book um, without trying to reveal too much about the content of the book. And I'd love to uh, open the floor up for some questions and reactions. Well, thanks, Jacob. We have plenty of time. So if you want to talk more about the book, feel free to, to do so. Um, tell us a little bit about your time at, at Google. What was it like to work work there and what exactly did you do? So um, the working at Google in 2016 was an extraordinary experience. The people there are incredibly hardworking, incredibly intelligent in a very humble way. Um, it, as, as I describe in the book, it really kind of, um, part of what made it unique was it was a unique place in time. Google being Google, you know, an iconic technology industry. And at that point in time, there was, this was before the tech lash. So, um, you know, there was still very much a honeymoon between Washington and Silicon Valley at that time. Um, and, um, and so there was just a very optimistic atmosphere, you know, in San Francisco and in the Bay Area uh, about the sense of possibilities and the sense that, there was a sense that every problem in the world had a technology solution. And there was an enormous amount of, of, of optimism um, that was incredibly inspiring. Um, ultimately, the years that followed, um, you know, we kind of saw that technology can kind of cut both ways, that you can do incredible things with it. And uh, people that are a little bit more ill-intentioned can also um, do nefarious things with it. And, and so I think it's it's it, it's incumbent on the stewards of uh, of technology to think through how do we prevent nefarious actors from getting their hands on things that could potentially be dangerous, uh, used in dangerous ways. Um, what do you think of the whistleblower's testimony at Facebook or? Yeah, at, at Facebook. I mean. <sighs> I think it's a little bit, um, from what I gather, the employee that left Facebook, um, I, I, I'm not sure she, you know, was, um, I'm not really sure how much responsibility she had inside of the company. So I'm a little bit skeptical of, um, and I think I'm not sure how much responsibility she had to the company. And I know that the press likes to, um, they likes to sensationalize a lot of, you know, technology related issues. Um, so I'm not totally, I, I wouldn't over index too much, um, um, you know, on her testimony. I, I think there's no doubt that there's clearly a lot of um, fair criticism to be leveled at uh, Facebook and you know the the decisions made by the leadership, but it's um, I'm a little bit skeptical about you know disgruntled employees that leave and have a lot of access to grind and you know uh, turn to the press to um, you know push narratives. Uh, I'm just not sure. I don't have enough. Uh, familiarity inside of the inner workings of Facebook to know how much responsibility she really had. Okay, fair enough. Um, on the other hand, what she points out is that you have these huge social media companies, and we'll, we'll include Google among them, um, that have enormous power and are unregulated. And they have become, in, in fact, uh, greater publishers of information and news than other companies that are regulated uh, by the Federal Communications Commission and other bodies. So should Google and Facebook and Twitter and other uh, Instagram and all these other companies um, in the social media space be regulated by the government in your view? Well, the tech companies have actually welcomed um, the government passing sensible regulation. Um, so I, I don't think it's, um, the main position that I try to articulate in the book is to basically think a lot about these issues with a very cool head and follow the evidence. Um, what concerns me is that I think a lot of the debate in the press um, 
often tends, and in Congress, sometimes tends to really boil down to a discomfort with the size and the bigness of these companies. Um, you know, a lot of the arguments tend to boil down to they're just so big, they have so much power that something has to be done to break them up. But um, a, a few different things, I mean, so when we think about should they be regulated, you know, let's think about what should they be regulated for? Um, if the issue is about content moderation, I, you know, questions relating, relating to speech is something that Congress can decide to legislate on on any day of the week. And it's, it's very, um, the reason that Congress hasn't done it is because it's really, really hard, you know, to actually uh, determine, you know, what concept, for Congress to basically prescribe, here's what constitutes hate speech, here's what constitutes, here's what, you know, the, the content policies should be for platforms. Um, here's, um, here's uh, how these content policies should apply to, Remember, platforms aren't a monolithic block. They have so many different features that people use in so many different ways. Just think about the Facebook platform. You have the feed, you have messaging features, you have shopping features. All of these different features are different. And so it's really, really hard to come up with a one size fits all content moderation policy. And if it was easy, co Congress would have absolutely done it. And in a way, I mean, these companies are in the business of building products that people like. They're not so much in the business of trying to create, you know, political rules. So it would be much, much easier for companies to basically pass that responsibility up to Congress. You know, you just tell us what to do. And, um, and that way, you know, it doesn't have to be politicized. Um, but, but, the, but content moderation issues are, are very difficult. And, um, and, so, and so, yeah, I mean, to answer your question on the content moderation piece, I think you know if Congress comes down, if, if where they land on a bipartisan basis, and if they have enough votes to decide that there is a there there, there have been abuses of you know quote unquote censorship, and regulation needs to be passed. I mean, have at it. Um, but uh, but I think that you know because you know that they haven't landed in that place because it, it's kind of hard to put your finger on how to define these platforms. Um, the, on on the antitrust question, um, I think that the I, I find the antitrust argument um, I'm not convinced by it because when you look at because our current antitrust doctrine was based on the abuse of um, uh, a dominant position in the marketplace in a way that causes consumer harm, and if you look completely dispassionately at you know, the underlying evidence of, you know, is there, um, do they have a dominant you know, position in the marketplace? So if you look at on the supply side of the market, um, I mean, all these companies are advertising companies. Um, you know, they all make, the way that they make money is through advertising. And, you know, there's obviously, um, I think Google has, um, like maybe 20% of the market, Facebook, I think has, or 24% of the market, I think Facebook has like 19% of the market. It, it, this isn't, um, you don't really, it's hard for me to parse out uh, where the monopoly exists on the supply side of the market. And on the demand side of the market, um, oh, and the other point on the supply side of the market is that um, the, the existence of, of these companies isn't really inhibiting competition. I mean, if you look at in the tech industry, um, there has been more capital invested in more new startups at higher valuations than at any point in the last 10 years. And so I'm talking about this year and last year. So it clearly, it doesn't seem like new entrepreneurs and new entrants in the marketplace seem to be very scared about competing with these big companies. The reason is that these big companies are slow, they make slow decisions, they measure time in quarters. A lot of tech founders that make decisions in minutes and days um, aren't very scared of competing with Google for the most part. Um, and, and venture capital investors are really backing that up with a lot of you know, billions and billions of dollars. Um, and then on the demand side of the market, um, it's, you know, a lot of these products are free. So it's how do you define the consumer harm 
uh, on, on the demand side of the equation. Um, so that's, I mean, those are the reasons that I don't, I, I find myself to be not convinced by a lot of the antitrust arguments. With that being said, um, I am at, if, if there is evidence that shows that, um, that, you know, there have been um, situations where uh, companies that have marketplaces that are both a marketplace and a market participant have abused, you know, that position as a marketplace to favor their own uh, products on the, on the marketplace, for example. Um, I'm completely, I think it's perfectly sensible to pass rules and regulations on that. Um, the, I think for me, where the leap becomes harder to make is some people have made the argument that, you know, the companies should be broken up. And I find, I find that to be a harder conclusion to draw, but I think it's perfectly reasonable if there is evidence of abuse to, you know, pass sensible rules around preventing, you know, abusive behavior. All right. Uh, let's move to some other issues. And we got questions rolling in now, so that's good. And we'll get to them in a second. Um, Intel just announced uh, last week that it's producing a semiconductor plant here in central Ohio. It's going to be, I think, one of the largest semiconductor plants in the world. Mm -hmm. um, and jobs are coming back to the United States. Um, how do we convince other nations to forego Chinese network equipment, such as 5G infrastructure, and buy from Intel or some other corporation uh, in the West instead? So um, the I think the conversation around semiconductors and um, is a little bit different than Huawei. I mean, although they're related, but uh, the first is our ban of um, of semiconductor exports to Huawei actually helps advance that goal quite a bit because it's put Huawei in um, a very strenuous position of difficulty that is going to make it very hard for them to expand their business in other markets. But to your point, how do in our direct engagements with our allies, how do we convince them to not buy Huawei? And I think fundamentally, it really boils down to a political decision on their part. I mean, if they just make a decision based on different price points, there's no question that right now, Huawei is the cheapest option. Um, we, there's a lot that we can do in the US to lower, I mean, Huawei is cheap because they're getting a lot of subsidies. You know, So there's a lot that we can do in the US to help favor our own industries to bring down the cost of our equipment. We don't have a 5G manufacturer in the US, unfortunately. The alternative to Huawei is um, Ericsson and Nokia. Um, but well, they're still know, based in the West though. So. Yeah, ex exactly, exactly. And, and so, which is also why actually, I mean, to your point, uh, one of the big arguments that you know, the US has going for itself as we talk with allies is the fact that when we ask allies not to use Huawei, it's not self-serving because it's not benefiting one of our companies. It's benefiting a European company um, because it, the genesis of the concern is really a, a cybersecurity concern that the Chinese can access everything that flows through Huawei. And I think if if the U.S. as a country, you know, if we're successful as a country in reshoring uh, very capital-intensive, um, expensive. Um, semiconductor fabs in the US, I think that could potentially be the pilot, you know, the use case that it'll be the success story that can show that it's possible to reshore certain things where it's very capital intensive, uh, so capital intensive that it require it does require public funds in order to jumpstart. Um, it's high value add. So, you know, it's obviously expensive and therefore it would make sense, you know, to use uh, some more expensive labor because you're going to sell it at a much higher price than the goods that are inexpensive. Let me give you the 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 statistics. The Intel plant is going to employ three thousand people, and the average salary is going to be one hundred and thirty-five thousand dollars a year. It's going to really turn Central Ohio into the Silicon Valley of the of the Midwest. Yeah, it's it's really. I mean, that's going to be transformative uh, for communities there. I mean. My grandfather worked at a Jeep factory in uh, Toledo after, you know, in the wake of World War II. And the hollowing out of manufacturing in that region uh, 
was incredibly debilitating for so many communities. And, and I think that for a long time, we've just kind of accepted as true that it's impossible to manufacture things, but I'm super excited to see that a lot of people are revisiting that assumption and that there's real money being invested into actually um, reshoring things that are high tech, you know, things that are the future and that are also important for the security of the country. Yeah, excellent. So, Joe, Steve, uh, why don't you go ahead and turn on your camera since you're a panelist and ask your question. Hey, Jacob, thanks very much. Uh, I find this all very interesting. So my question is kind of about the role of 2016 in how the how big tech companies think about their role in politics, disinformation. There's kind of a popular narrative out there that 2016 was sort of this wake up call or awakening. Uh, to disinformation, to foreign interference. Is that a myth or is there some truth to that in, in your experience and in terms of what other companies? Well, I, I think it's so important to parse out what we mean by disinformation because people will use that term to refer to things that are kind of different. Um, so, I you know, what I talk about in my book isn't um, it's really about the narrow subset of issues that amount to a foreign government trying to masquerade as uh, an American-based news outlet um, uh, to deceive and um, and uh, to be to deceive readers and and misrepresent who they are, and so I think fundamentally that is a that is a, a, a challenge that um, can be addressed by looking at patterns of bad behavior. You don't even have to look at what they're saying. This is really about the patterns of, of behavior and, and about the conduct. When you see that there is a foreign government agency that is misrepresenting who they are, that's masquerading itself as a domestic publication, um, you could easily derive a set of principles that's based on existing doctrines that we have. I mean, you have in the US, we currently have the Foreign Agents Registration Act. Um, if you are a foreign agent, you are expected to register. So we already have laws in the U.S. that at least philosophically, there is an expectation that if you're a foreign government and you have, and you have agents in the U.S., you're not allowed to do that covertly. You're expected to be transparent about it. Um, I think that is very different than, you know, uh, when people use the word disinformation to refer to lies in politics, you know, people just saying crazy things in politics. Um, the latter, that's always been around. And I think, unfortunately, it's part of the colorful tapestry of our country that um, we've always had people that, you know, have said um, uh, all kinds of things in our political system. And, and I would be very reluctant um, to interfere with that, you know, process. I mean, I think that um, free speech is such an important uh, aspect about you know, what makes our platforms vibrant and what makes our discord vibrant. And, uh, and if you think about it, it's, it's actually unsavory speech. Our first amendment is really meant to protect unsavory speech because speech that everyone agrees with isn't this type of speech that needs protecting. It's the speech that, you know, is viewed heretical, that's viewed uh, as unsavory. And, and the reason that I think it's so important is, um, is you know at, at at in the tech industry back in the days when you know in 2016 and 2017, um, one of the big arguments against trying to interfere with that was the emerging theories argument, which is that you can be absolutely convinced today that something is true, and then an emerging theory emerges that disproves it. But before that emerging theory is accepted as true. Uh, it is initially viewed as heretical. And so if you allow, you know, a quote unquote, if you become too censorious where you don't allow room for emerging theories, you actually undercut some really important ideas. And so we allow the emerging theory that the election of 2020 was stolen and Donald Trump is the real president? Well, it, you know, it's... Um, I think it has to be, I'm not saying that that's not true. It's not true, but uh, it has to be, we have to allow people to, you know, say what, you know, express their viewpoints. Yeah, but the, um, doesn't that then undermine our democracy when people don't accept the outcomes of elections? 
But I think it also undermines our democracy when we basically start censoring people. So I think, I mean, the answer to bad speech is more good speech um, rather than, you know, uh, uh, one slightly different example is, for example, the origins around the coronavirus. Um, at the beginning of the pandemic, it was viewed as extremely fringe to question whether or not the, the coronavirus came out of a lab in Wuhan versus came from a wet market. And, and I mean, it was frowned upon. It was socially frowned upon. You know, the press called it out as some crazy conspiracy theory. Twitter would basically... Um, penalized accounts that uh, that um, that you know uh, questioned the origins of the coronavirus pandemic. and and as it turns out, you know the, the our own intelligence community has actually said that they can't rule that out as an option. Um, so I think that's a real example of something where it started out as being perceived as insane, but it's actually has you know merits to it and it's probably worthy of at least a debate. Um, given how consequential, you know, the coronavirus pandemic has been. Uh, Joe, do you have a follow up or? I, I, would, I would like to follow up real quick. Yeah, th thank you, Jacob. I, my yeah, only... and I know, and I know oh, that yeah, these yeah. The, the, these questions are, you know, they're um, they're hard questions where reasonable people land in different places. So, uh, you know, I, I know that is, there are questions that people get heated about, and you know, it's um, it's obviously, um, I think debating them is a healthy thing yeah I'm, I'm not trying to pick a fight i'm trying to pick, no. pick the brain uh and i, I think my only follow-up question is kind of more in actually basically a philosophical question is that uh what, what you're all saying makes sense in terms of the public square right it's a very john stuart mill kind of argument it reminds me of it's it's you know the marketplace of ideas but facebook twitter right, social media platforms are not the public square right I mean, do, do, do they think of themselves as the public square? Should they be conceived that way? Because I, I would have agreed with you six years ago, but I, I don't anymore. And I think that's kind of what Pete was expressing. Well, I'll, I'll leave, I'll leave what changed? <laughs> oh, what, what changed? changed? I, I mean, uh, just the, the vast proliferation of lies just, and its ability to corrupt our politics and, and undermine democracy. That's That's been my main concern. Not that that didn't exist. It's not a day to night change, but just yeah, the yeah. intensification of it. And to be you know frank about it, my complete inability to persuade many of my relatives of, of basic facts. Um, well, so I think, I mean, your question about whether are they a public square, I think you really hit the nail on the head because one of the challenges as a society that we struggle with, tech companies struggle with this, the Congress struggles with this, reporters struggle with this, is, you know, we have a system in our common law system where so much of our laws are based on analogies. You know, when you develop a new law, it's very common for a judge or a legislator to basically think through what is the right analogy for this fact pattern. You know, is it um, is uh, Facebook a, a newspaper? Is it a public square? Is it a telephone? People use analogies to frame how to think about you know legal concepts, and what makes it really hard is um, we haven't really developed as a society. We haven't developed the analogies to frame how we should interact with and relate to a lot of modern day platforms. Um, I think part of the reason is because the different platforms, when you, when you really dig into it, they're actually pretty different. Uh, I mean, people mentioned Google, Facebook, and Twitter in the same breath, but they're actually pretty different in terms of how they work and how people use them. And the thing that makes it extra hard is that they change over time and within, you know, the page, you have so many different features that, you know, one page is more like a newspaper, the other page is more like a telephone, the other page is, you know, more like the public square. And it's just, there's so many different um, aspects to it that it's really hard to come up with what is our overarching, you know, analogy that we use to basically define how these platforms should be governed. And so I think, you know, my, as a citizen, my, my viewpoint where I've landed on this is, um, I think it's fine for platforms to basically um, have principles that focus on bad you know, patterns of bad behavior. But when it comes to, but because they are subject to Section 230, which is um, 
uh, a liability, you know, exemption where basically, uh, you know, th for people that aren't familiar with Section 230, it's basically um, a statute that allows platform to uh, be neutral platforms and, you know, not li not directly liable for the content on their platforms. And so because of Section 230, I think that what makes what would make the most sense is that if a platform benefits from Section 230, then it should simply mirror um, American jurisprudence in order to avoid the platform, um, you know, making discretionary decisions that end up being highly politicized and controversial. And um, to your point about lies and disinformation, there are actually quite a lot of in, in our current body, you know, of laws. Um, the, you know, you have the First Amendment, but you also do have quite a lot of principles. Uh, the First Amendment isn't totally unfettered. I mean, you know, you can't yell fire in a, in a movie theater. You have time, place, and manner restrictions. Um, we have, you know, uh, th there have been, there's been a lot of case law around fighting words and incitement to violence. So I think drawing on laws that, you know, have already been, um, uh, were you know have already been the product of the workings of a democratic process and those are much much more legitimate ways of basically saying how you know these these um platforms are going to be governed and ultimately i think it's if if i worked at a tech company today that's probably the case that i would be making just because uh when platforms you know develop rules out of a hat it, it just tends to be extremely controversial Okay, uh, Joe, feel free to drop off whenever. Uh, Rick Herman, if you want to turn on your camera and ask your question. Hi, Jacob. Thank you for coming. And even if it's virtual, I enjoyed this talk. I, I, because we have a lot of questions piling up, I'm going to just ask uh, one very quick one, which is, um, can you name two or three things that you think Google should do uh, to combat disinformation? You, you did a nice job laying out what you see as the threats but I'm wondering if you can just tick off two or three things that Google either did because you thought that was a good idea or you think it should do uh, to combat this information or is there nothing it should do? Um, well, I'll, I'll describe two or three, you know, a couple of things that the tech industry generally, uh, if it's okay with yeah, you. I, I understand there may be limits to what you can say about Google, but I'm, I'm curious about some of the concrete moves that either you proposed or we could be thinking about. Well, so one of the things that I think um, there's still a lot of uh, untapped opportunity is um, one of the one of the ideas that I talk about in the book is um, because I'm of the view that you can tackle a lot of the most nefarious you know aspects about foreign interference by just looking at behavior without looking at the content. Um, addressing that effectively is really an, an intel problem. It's, do you have enough intel about, you know, we know what the real world actors are. You know, it's Russia, it's China. We know what their intelligence agencies are. And so from that starting point, it really becomes a matter of, do we have the ability to basically um, do the forensics to find what their online media assets are? across platforms because they take advantage of the silos between platforms, between our government and, and the public sector, uh, be, between our government and the private sector. Um, and, so, and so if you're able to basically create, you know, an Intel analysis center that's run out of the government that has the authorities to issue uh, intelligence requests to private companies where private companies you know, hand over information, um, targeted narrow information about specific real world actors linked to foreign agencies. Um, I think that would go a long way because the government has a lot of data that private companies doesn't have. Um, so, and, and ultimately, I mean, the business of tracking foreign agents is really the government's job more than, you know, private companies job. Um, and so, And so I think that could potentially um, really go a long way in, in helping, you know, address a lot of the foreign espionage, you know, a lot of the foreign agents problems that we have in the U.S. Trying to um, meddle in our in our politics. Uh, let me just follow up quickly. You've mentioned in your book and in the talk this afternoon about this state 
cooperation with private sector. Mm -hmm. And that gets tricky both because as you just are an example, you can't go too deep into Google uh, uh, publicly. And I'm sure Google doesn't want the state too deeply into its business. And I'm not sure um, that I want the government deciding which foreign uh, aid, uh, actors I can access through the Google or through the internet, right? I mean, I don't know who the US government would decide to try to uh, block out in that regard. And so I'm wondering if you, again, in kind of a concrete way, are there two or three things that you think the government and uh, the tech industry generally uh, could do that they're not doing and should do? You've mentioned one, set up an Intel center, I guess, where the US government would funnel to the tech industries mm -hmm. who it suspects are foreign agents. Uh, are there other things that you see where there are big doors blocking cooperation between government and Google that should be removed or should they be right where they are? Yes, I mean, I think on, um, so I have a whole chapter in my book that's about, you know, the rift between the hill and the valley. And I brought up the Intel Center because we were just talking about the disinformation challenge, but, um, and, and, you know, as, as you point out, the Intel Center would really be just about identifying foreign agents, not, you know, it wouldn't be broader than that. Um, so it's a pretty narrow targeted pr problem that it would try to solve. But um, at a broader level, I think one of the things that the private sector should and could do is be much more forward leaning with trying to help the government solve hard policy challenges. So obviously national security is ground zero for that because our government needs a lot of help. I mean, a lot of the newest um, technologies, you know, cutting edge technologies are coming out of the private sector, not the public sector. And so, we, you know, we find ourselves at a time today when we have had several secretaries of defense now that have basically said that they would like to integrate AI at every layer of the Pentagon to modernize our defense. How do we do that, you know, uh, without having um, thousands of engineers working at the Pentagon trying to do this in-house? Uh, short of doing it in-house, the Pentagon is going to have to rely by uh, with collaborating with an external private sector entity. And so having help from some of our most successful companies would be insanely useful. But beyond just defense, I mean, as a country, we have a lot of policy challenges that we could use, you know, tech's help for, you know, we could use uh, technology help with transportation, we could use it with, you know, better allocating resources, budgetary resources. Um, there's so many different policy challenges that are ripe for um, modernizing that I think leveraging the creativity and talent of some of these companies to solve some of these challenges would really be uh, a public, you know, a great national public service. Um, and, and I think that's something that, um, you know, it would be an act of patriotism and, and you know, um, that, that I think would, you know, would certainly, that I'd be certainly very supportive of. Conversely, I mean, I do think that sometimes um, it's the government's job to exercise a healthy dose of scrutiny on our private sector. And I think, you know, our tech companies um, are obviously should be no exception to that. But I do worry sometimes that, um, be, that it's becoming politically expedient to use some of the big technology companies as a pinata because it plays well on the campaign trail, that politicians tend to rely on that a little bit. Uh, in a way that's counterproductive to the overarching, you know, goal of, you know, increasing collaboration between tech and the public sector. So it, this is kind of a long-winded way of saying that I think there's a bit of blame on both, you know, there's plenty of blame to go around, but ultimately I think where we should want this to go as a country is for much closer collaboration between the hill and the valley. All right, thanks, Rick. You can drop off. Um, Jacob, we have about 12 questions. So if you could limit your response to two or three minutes per, this would be, we could get through them all. Uh, James good. Ray asks, uh, which countries does China control by the technological means you describe, or is it close to controlling any countries in this way? And it will be, will it be obvious when it happens? Um, the short answer is it won't be obvious. One of the aspects, one of the defining features of the gray war is that it's, it's very ambiguous um, and it's often very covert. 
China is very involved in Africa and it's uh, been very aggressive in trying to export its information infrastructure in several sub-Saharan African countries. So that would probably be the first region uh, that I would look at very closely to monitor the level of influence that China is exerting um, in, you know, in those countries. Okay, uh, David Woods asks, what is the role of bots, algorithms, and automation in the impact and scale of disinformation? Um, well, it's uh, a lot of um, a lot of scholars have, you know, come up. Truthfully, a lot of scholars have landed in different, have drawn different conclusions from this. Um, there's no question that, um, you know, we live in an information environment where you do have a lot of bots. Um, the degree to which they actually change the way people think, I think is more debatable. Um, Tom McDonough asks, uh, or actually comments, since our supply chain is very intertwined with China, isn't there a school of thought in a, in a broad sense that the high degree of uh, connectedness makes the world safer uh, towards reducing the threat of a real war? Is there a form of mutually assured destruction here, given the inner- Yeah, I mean, that, that was very much the predominant you know, school of thought behind embracing, um, you know, China bought our debt, we have a lot of all of our supply chains there, we're mutually reliant on each other, economically integrated. And fundamentally, this is like the, the, the peace through trade theory, world peace through world trade. Um, and, and unfortunately, um, you know, we tried it and it just, the problem is, is that China has, be, you know, we, we embraced it but predicated on the assumption that China would ultimately become freer and more democratic, but it's become more tenuous to be so intertwined with a country that is becoming more and more powerful and fundamentally wants to change the status quo in the world in a way that is more comp compliant with its vision of how the world should be run. And because we're a democracy and they're an autocracy, we have fundamentally different views on how to run the world. Um, that's very hard to reconcile. And the last point that I would add, uh, and I know that I'm going to try to keep it short, is, um, is um, um, at the end of the day, one of the challenges with uh, being so intertwined is China is racing to decouple from us. And so we have to ask ourselves, are we really intertwined if uh, they're no longer relying on us and we're relying on them. You know, it's not so much an intertwined situation, it's more a one-way dependence um, paradigm. And so that's very risky for us. They, they have us uh, over a barrel in the terms of uh, some of the raw materials we need for high-tech goods though, right? The rare earths that only come from China right now? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, they, uh, they produce, uh, I think it's 90% of, uh, of the world's rare earth uh, supplies. So it's, they definitely have a control over that market. Not good. Uh, Mike Haas uh, comments that he received a, a camera for Christmas. Congratulations, Mike. Uh, but it requires him to install a Chinese app on his cell phone to activate it. The app requires access to my location and camera for activation. Do you foresee the government regulation um, do you foresee government regulation and consumer grade IT and mobile apps? And is he screwed? <laughs> um, I, uh, I mean, do I think it would be the right thing? Yes. Do I foresee it? Probably not. Um, and uh, you know, your your app, I think it would probably fall in the same category as TikTok, for example, where it's a consumer product. It seems innocuous, but the issue, the reason that it's a problem is because the app itself is able to collect a bunch of sensitive data from your phone. It's not so much about what you do on the app. It's more about the ability of the app to basically vacuum up your location, you know, your text messages, your um, call log history. I mean, so much sensitive data. Um, and so that's really the cybersecurity concern. And, 
And so ultimately, I think it'd be the right thing to do. I'm, I don't think it's going to happen under this administration. Um, and, you know, and so I think it's going to take a lot of political capital for Congress to uh, challenge consumer apps. Uh, so. Okay. A uh, reminder to people, if they have questions, uh, don't raise your hand because uh, we can't turn on your camera. Just ask the question in the Q&A box. Uh, John Mueller, a longtime member of the Mershon community, uh, Professor Emeritus, asks how much of this is really new. Uh, suppression and promulgation of information and misinformation has been around for a long time, as has surveillance. Uh, he's been bombarded with misleading ads since he was a, a young boy. Every government business has spied on others forever. Jobs lost overseas has been a complaint for centuries. So what's what's new here? Um, what's new is, so with respect to disinformation, I don't think there's much, I don't think there's anything new. Um, as, as they point out, there's, you know, it's always been around. Um, the main thing that's new is really the means, the tools being used is really the only thing, the primary thing that's new and the ability of people to, um, reach a scope of impact that's different using these tools. But um, he's he's right in the sense that the under, people are using new tools to carry out things that have been um, done for a while. Okay. Um, Adrian Calmetes, hopefully I pronounced that all right. Uh, says that some scholars have argued that the fear of an artificial intelligence cold war is inflated. Um, you talk about wires and hardware as important weapons, but the U.S. seems to have a clear advantage in these industries. Can you talk a bit more about that? And what would be the consequences of your takeaways for countries beyond the U.S., whether they're in the EU or in the global south? And sorry, I'm just not sure I totally understand that question. Um, all right, so does the US have an advantage when it comes to wires and hardware? Um, because I'd be surprised if that actually is the case. Um, and then, so talk about who has the advantage in producing stuff right now, the, the, the stuff of IT infrastructures. Yeah. And then what, what are the consequences of, and then a separate question, what are the consequences of your takeaways for countries beyond the US for the EU or countries in the global south. So right now, today, the US does not have an advantage, um, primarily because if you ask yourself, what are the inputs needed to produce a lot of the finished hardware products? The US lacks quite a lot of them. It has, you need uh, labor, capital, and raw materials. The US has the capital, but we're lacking in the specialized technical labor. And we're also lacking in the raw materials needed. China, you know, the reason China is so involved in Africa is because they want the raw materials in order to manufacture goods that they export everywhere else. And so, um, and so we're behind on that. With that being said, China isn't a country that you know was a, has these naturally endowed advantages. They've they've worked hard to accrue and build you know, these advantages over time, an enormous reservoir of highly skilled labor, uh, all kinds of trading arrangements in Africa to get cheap raw materials. So I, I'm, you know, eternally optimistic that with the right policy frameworks in place, we can actually um, leapfrog and, and catch up. Um, but, but, you know, the question points out accurately that right now we, we don't have those advantages right now. Okay. Uh, John Hoffman, um, longtime friend of the community, says in your book, you express skepticism about Zoom being able to resolve its difficulties operating in both the United States and China. Has Zoom made any progress in that area? So the, the, um, um, the Zoom is really meant to be an example of um, my fundamental skepticism in the one country, two systems model where, sorry, the one government, two systems model, one company, two systems model, it's, it's been a long day, um, <laughs> where you have um, where you have one company that operates in, you know, that tries to straddle the fence between the US and China. And, it, and because it tries to do that, it has to comply with two legal systems that are fundamentally at odds. And therefore it has two systems, one for China, one for the US. 
and it constantly has to struggle between complying in a system of laws that is fundamentally in conflict with each other. And just to give you a bit of an example, in the US, we have a system of laws that's based on the protection of IP, the protection of privacy, of, of free speech. In China, you're expected to, the system is based on total compliance with the CCP and companies and people are, are expected to hand over information, censor, censor speech. And so it's really hard to comply with both laws that if the laws contradict each other. Um, and so that's why ultimately I don't think it's tenable for as tensions between the two countries escalate, I don't think it's tenable for companies to continue trying to straddle both sides of the fence. Okay. Uh, Colin Jones asks a technical question. <clears throat> Is it possible for a third party to hack into an online news outlet and change a story? Insert a paragraph for a, another paragraph that changes the story. Um, you know, what's to prevent someone from doing that? And uh, I guess this is not part of his question, but part of what I've learned um, is that, you know, the technology is, uh, is soon appearing where you can actually capture speech from a person and create him saying something that's he didn't say or she didn't say. And you could like blackmail politicians with videos that are created basically for this sorts of purpose. So what, so what about the sort of like the technical aspects of hacking in this regard? Yeah. Um, so as I talk about in the book, there are three things that the, one of the reasons that I find the information infrastructure piece of uh, U.S. China competition so important is because if you control the Internet's infrastructure, you can do China can do three things by virtue of its control of Huawei. It can extract data, block data, and change data that flows through its networks. Um, extract data, that basically means you know, stealing information, IP theft, um, or, or surveillance. Uh, blocking data would basically be debilitating you know, a company's ability to access its digital, um, its you know, online, its computer infrastructure. And modifying the data is the more pernicious piece that you refer to, which is if the New York Times ran on Huawei, would Huawei actually be able to um, covertly insert articles in the New York Times um, you know, that the New York Times did indirectly write? And there hasn't been a lot of incidents um, about that to date, but based on all the conversations I've had with people in the intelligence community, as well as in the tech industry, um, I, I believe that it would absolutely be technically possible for Huawei to do something like that, absolutely. I would imagine that the owner of the website would catch it pretty quickly. Um, Barbara Roth wonders if it's possible for smaller, weaker states or non-state actors to punch above their weight by developing capabilities um, uh, that, you know, allow them to use technology to their advantage. Um, if you don't have hard power, you know, you can use brain power to get ahead. What do you, what are your thoughts on that? Um, I completely agree with Barbara, uh, and you know, a great example for this is Israel, um, that is obviously a, a tiny country that's you know barely the size of of New Jersey, and has been able to punch way way above its weight thanks to its leadership in key technology areas. Okay, uh, by the way, we have about twenty more minutes, so only four more questions, so you can expound on your answers <laughs> if you want. We've plowed through a number of them. Um, David Saul Acosta wants to know what policy should policymakers be enacting to encourage the revitalization of industrialization in the United States? And uh, with that, if you know anything about the CHIPS Act, your thoughts on that? Yeah, um, the, CHIP the CHIPS Act is um, a fantastic piece of legislation that would invest roughly you know, 50 or $52 billion in 
to incentivize the pr domestic production of semiconductor chips in the US. Um, it has both subsidies and grants, as well as tax incentives, um, which are incredibly important to provide companies the kind of business certainty that they need in order to make long, big multi-year investments. And, um, and I think it would be uh, a very, very useful step in the right direction. There are some outstanding concerns with the CHIPS Act um, about how do you make sure if, if the government is gonna spend so much money to produce things here, how do we make sure that the, once companies get the money that for example, Qualcomm isn't gonna take that money and then use half of it to expand its manufacturing activities in China. Um, so there are some concerns with respect to, you know, how is the legislation framed in order to address for that and prevent that. Um, and I certainly hope that members of Congress uh, figure out a way to address that concern and pass the legislation that um, is effective. So do we in central Ohio, given that it <laughs> impacts the Intel factory coming here. Uh, and no doubt that's gonna be the first of many high tech factories that are gonna be coming here because of that. Um, because you have that educational pipeline now, there's gonna be programs created at Ohio State and other universities in the area to create the kind of programs to educate students for those jobs. So, That's great. It's great uh, to hear that Ohio State is going to create programs for that because it's they're so direly, direly needed. And I think that um, some of the uh, a lot of the universities on the coast have tended to um, like, for example, Stanford's done a really good job at having a computer science program, but um, it doesn't it hasn't really so many of the student so many people in the student body gravitates towards computer science because they think that that's where the jobs are. Um, and as a result, unlike in China, for example, we don't have a lot of people that do electrical engineering, which if you do software, computer science is great. If you wanna do hardware, uh, you need electrical engineers and, um, and people that uh, have training in, um, in fields where they're able to help build hardware products. And we have a lot less of that and so, um, it's really great to hear that Ohio State is leading in, you know, in, in creating programs in that space. Well, and it's compared to Stanford, it's an issue of scale. Our undergrad enrollment is about 44,000. Stanford's undergrad enrollment is 6,000. So you can imagine the, um, you know, that was obviously one of the things that Intel looked at when they came. Right, 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 right. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, so uh, I'm going to butcher this name, but I'll pronounce it phonetically. Uh, Jeppe Munchdal Nielsen, and I'm sure that's not pronounced correctly, but I apologize, asks, what role will non-state actors play in relation to the current technological revolution? Example, does newer technology increase the threat level of terrorist groups? Um. I think they do, but um, I mean, we have, um, our national security apparatus has done a, a really, really great job at mitigating ter you know, the threat from terrorist groups over the last 20 years. Um, so, you know, I think they do on the margins, but I think the bigger risk is if China or Russia or a large foreign state power uses a non-state power as a proxy. I don't think that uh, Al-Qaeda on their own are gonna develop, I mean, they have, you know, they have been uh, dabbling, they have been using crypto, they've been using, they've tried to, you know, uh, train hackers, they've been trying to modernize, but they're never gonna compete in, you know, quantum computing and in hypersonic missiles and all that. Um, and And so, you know, I think I'd be a little bit more concerned is what happens if China wants to use some sort of proxy to hurt the U.S. without taking responsibility and finds, you know, crafty ways of doing that. And I don't know if you guys saw, but I mean, this isn't a non-state actor, it's a state actor, but 
um, in North Korea allegedly tested a hypersonic missile not that long ago. Now, apparently it's, it's, apparently it's not a real hypersonic missile, but uh, there's no question that if, if North Korea develops hypersonic capabilities in the near future, it will absolutely be because of help from China, because there's no way that North Korea on its own has the ability to develop hy hypersonic anything. Um, so, so I think that's, you know, that's obviously an example where um, our, our chief adversaries are really China and, you know, to a secondary extent, Russia and, and, um, and then, you know, a lot of the, the other non-state threats can often flow from uh, that broader great power competition. For years, uh, people, some pundits have said that, you know, there's going to be a cyber Pearl Harbor someday. But given the constant barrage of attacks, aren't we somewhat inured to a cyber Pearl Harbor? Or is there something just so new out there that could be unleashed that could take down our electrical grid, for instance? Um, I think that one of the, um, I mean, I, I think the threat of a cyber Pearl Harbor is real, um, but it's, um, it's, it's most likely in the event of uh, a conflict, uh, an actual conflict or, or some sort of escalation with either Russia or China. And um, I mean, I, I don't think that they're, I don't think that we're at risk of facing a cyber Pearl Harbor, it, you know, as, as, as a spontaneous cyber attack. I think if you have a situation in either Ukraine or the South China Sea, where we enter, you know, tensions escalate and we start to stumble into a hot conflict confrontation, I think that's when you could start to see some major cyber attacks take place either as retaliation for if we put in place sanctions against Putin that are very damaging to Putin, um, it's very possible that as retaliation, you're gonna to start to see you know, pretty significant cyber attacks on American companies, on American uh, agencies. Um, that's very possible. A, a Pearl Harbor level event, like on our uh, critical infrastructure, for example, I think is more of a, a hot war type scenario. But I do think that it's incredibly, it's a very salient concern because if you think about it, our homeland, with the exception of 9-11, um, we've never known a war, you know, an actual war coming to our shores um, uh, ever since 9-11, the Civil War, and, you know, the Revolutionary War. Um, we've never had a war directly on our shores. And so with cyber, you could have a situation where, you know, you could have, if it things get really bad, it's not impossible that you could see cyber attacks on our grid, on our power plants, on our nuclear power plants, where you could potentially see explosions go off on our land um, without a single airplane flying over, you know, the U.S. And so thinking about how to protect our critical infrastructure, I think, is enormously important. Yeah, I see you omitted Alaska and Hawaii from the United States as they were attacked in World War II. But <laughs> that's right. <true. laughs> the, 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 the you know continental U.S. Yeah, continental United States. Um, let's talk a little bit about who benefits from the wires of war. So China is able to put up the Great Firewall and dominate what what its citizens uh, see and hear. Um, other nations do the same thing, and yet in the West we have open internet architecture, anyone can post just about anything and foreign countries, governments can play in that space. Russia does to a big extent and, and you know, they just wanna see chaos um, in our society and they're succeeding in that regard. So who's actually benefited the most from the internet? The authoritarian governments or, you know, the, the open society? I, think, I, I, I still think that net net, I mean, I think technologies are neutral so, you know, in the same way that you could use steel to build a hospital or you could use it to build a machine gun, um, fundamentally, the internet has both been uh, uh, an incredibly powerful vehicle of liberation for some. And unfortunately, in some other parts of the world, it's also been hijacked as a tool of repression. Part of what we've seen is, 
um, you know, for the from the latter 90s, the latter half of the 90s to the most of the 2000s, um, there was an enormous amount of hope and optimism that the internet would inherently be a force of lib political liberalization. And, you know, President Clinton famously said that, uh, you know, trying to control the internet was like nailing jello to the wall, it'd be virtually impossible. And part China's of done a pretty good job of it, though. Haven't China's, they? I mean, they've done it. So, um, and and so part of what we've seen is actually the internet is starting to become to look more like you know the traditional analog world, which is some countries are free, some countries are not free, and the internet simply reflects that. Um, what's dangerous is when countries use the internet to um, you know engage in activities that go beyond their borders. And so that's obviously uh, something that's a little bit new, um, but, um, but, but I, I don't think it's either, you know, I don't think it's, it's, it's an all win or all lose type thing. I think it's more just that governments have used the internet in different ways. Um, we may see a conflict uh, between Russia and Ukraine here when the weather, when the ground freezes over. Um, if we wanted to say block all URLs coming from Russia, anything originating from Russia, could we do it? Is that possible, technically possible? It's technically possible. It would be, you know, not, um, yeah, it's technically, it's technically possible. It's, you know, obviously it's, it, it'd be complicated to do um, uh, because in, in part of the part of a characteristic of the US is because we're the country where the internet was born, we have so many internet cables that crisscross this country and connect this country to other regions because this is where the internet came out of, that it would be technically difficult to have a, you know, to try to orchestrate a centralized approach like that, but it is technically possible. Um, okay, well, we're out of questions. Uh, I would ask the guests to keep their questions on topic, um, uh, you know, in, in a deference to our guest and his particular expertise. So um, we have about six minutes left. If there's anything you would like to close with, we could do that. Um, so the main concluding thoughts that I'd like to leave you with are that in the foreign policy community, I think a lot of the times, um, for a long time, people have gone from um, denial to despair in terms of, you know, denying that we have a serious challenge and formidable challenger in China to um, a slight, slightly subtle sense of despair, you know, thinking, well, you know, they're one point four billion people, they're so big, there's no way we can compete with them long term. And, and I think that it's actually one of the things that I find myself to be incredibly optimistic about in the US is that there's no question China has 1.4 billion people, but the CCP is a government that I think only looking at raw resources like numbers of people omits a critical aspect of this competition, which is ideas and the difference in ideas between, uh, between our, our countries. Um, you know, in the US, it's not just a, a competition between two countries, it's a competition between two ideas of systems. And in the US, uh, President Clinton, you know, and, and actually several other presidents used to say that America is an idea as much as it is a country. And you know, our ideas are based on allowing people to reach their God-given potential, being a melting pot, embracing people's differences and, uh, you know, uniqueness and sense of individuality and, um, and, you know, the pursuit of life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness. Um, in China, you have a system where individuality is inherently frowned upon. And you saw that with um, the tennis player Peng Shui, you see that with the crackdown against tech leaders. It's very uncomfortable for Xi Jinping to allow other individuals to have prominence in their systems. And so fundamentally, you know, you see the cracks in their system by virtue of the simple fact that Xi Jinping is a man who boasts himself in front of the world, surrounded by masses of armed men, tanks, you know, military parades, 
And yet he's terrified of thoughts and words. And I think that is where, you know, that is where our relative strength really shines through and why ultimately we have every reason to be confident that our system can actually prevail and we can actually win this competition because fundamentally we're on the side of a system that most people in the world probably want much more than living under uh, a, a type of system that is governed by the CCP. Well, very good. I think we'll, we'll end it up, wrap it up there. Jacob, thank you very much for your time. For those of you who are tuning in, the book is The Wires of War by Jacob Helberg. And um, go out and buy a comp copy and uh, read about everything that he um, fills in the blanks of what he talked about today. So thank you all uh, for coming. Uh, for those of you um, interested in the Mershon community, the next event is going to be February 3rd. Uh, Jim Schnell uh, is going to talk about Myanmar and his time there as a Fulbright fellow. It's four o'clock to five o'clock p.m. and you can find um, a link to register on the Mershon website. So thank you all for uh, showing up today. And um, on behalf of my colleagues in the American Foreign and Military Policy Cluster, uh, thanks for attending the virtual Mershon Center. Thanks again, Jacob.